Welcome back to Beyond the Headline, everyone. I'm excited you're here with us on the show because I'm here with the co-founder and CEO of Go, Kevin Pomplin. Thank you for being here, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Can we start out with you introducing us to how Go works? Yeah, so Go is a free app for iPhone and it lets you compare car insurance. So you put in a few pieces of information and then under 60 seconds, you've got a quote and you can see if you're able to save money. And then if you are, you can go ahead and call and um, from there have a lower insurance quote. And you and I were just briefly chatting about your stop. Your first company, Skygrid, was acquired and then you spent some time at Facebook where you intended to stay for a while, but you got really inspired by the potential of this idea. What was the genesis for you? I, I thought that your mobile phone had a, a lot of interesting information, and I thought there were, you know, we were basically now doing everything on our phone from taking photos to sending messages to watching videos. And car insurance is something we all have as well, but there was no really easy way to do it on your phone. So I thought by using your mobile phone, we could make it very easy to get car insurance really fast. And then we found out that by actually using your mobile phone, we could help you save money by telling things like where you live or how many miles you drive or. If you're a student, what kind of discount you could get. Um, and so we just started building that and kind of went from there. And last I saw, the average savings was $342 a year. Is that right or is it more than that now? Uh, that's actually, yeah, that's the number we have listed, but it actually is more than that now. So um, we're seeing the, the average person is saving around $500 now, which is actually higher than we thought it would be. And I want to spend some time really diving into the way you approach mobile because car insurance and mobile you don't think you're going to ever have the two together but we're all glad that we do because it really streamlines the process what were some of the core ideas you had to strip away from the process and simplify it um i think one of them was we wanted it just to be very fast and light so in the way that you pick up your phone and you tap a button and take a photo um, we wanted you to be able to pick up your phone and go through a few screens and then see if you were able to save money. Um, so thinking about how fast it would be and how easy it would be were um, a couple of the things that, that really influenced the, the product. Um, and then also by using your mobile phone to save you time. So things like even typing in your zip code, instead of having to pull up a keyboard, change it to the number keyboard, put in all those keys and then hit done, you can just push one button that will use your current location and it will fill it out for you. Um, so we really tried to think about all the mobile capabilities of the phone, how that would make it easier to get a quote on something like desktop, or even if you had to like walk into an office and tell someone, you know, the answers to all those questions. And one of the things that you mentioned even before that was actually using your phone as a way to help you save money because it tracks where you go. If you ask Go, it will. Um, so if, if you ask Go and then give it permission, we can show you things like how many miles you drive. Or we can send you notifications at certain times of year. Like if you're a student, you can actually save money at the start of a semester or the end of a semester based on your grades. Um, so it's nice to tell your phone, like, hey, can you remind me this? And then it'll send you a notification and remind you to get your savings um, instead of having to you know, think about it yourself, which a lot of people forget. I'm glad that you mentioned notifications because I think we're at a place right now where we have so many apps that it almost feels like when you get up in the morning and you check your phone, you're bombarded because it's just, you, you keep scrolling and it never ends. So the result, for me at least, has been I just don't read them. Mm -hmm. How have you guys approached notifications? You mentioned I think school is a great one, that you're going to notify me at the beginning of a semester. Excuse me. So I think um, we really tried to only send you notifications we think you absolutely will use. So some of the other apps you've um, mentioned, you know, we'll send you notifications about lots of different things. We want to only send you a notification when you'll save money or when there's something new for the exact kind of car you have. Um, so we try to send you a very small number of notifications that are only things that will directly help you. And by doing that, we found that the people respond a lot better to them. The other thing is because we save money, um, people end up coming back to go. So actually, three out of ten people will come back to go on their own without ever receiving a notification within the first two weeks, um, which is something you usually see. Uh, in a social app, but you don't see in a utility app like like Go for insurance. And as far as that notification, despite it being something that's helpful for me, it's all about the timing of the notification, the way you word it. How have you approached that? Uh, we do a lot of testing, so we want to say things in a way that's that's easy for anyone to understand and hear. So 
Um, we'll try different things like send them at different times of day um, or change the way something is worded um, or even when you tap the notification where it opens the app. Those are all different things we, we test. So we do a lot, of, um, a lot of iteration and a lot of testing to make sure we're making the product as, as simple as it can be. What have you gleaned from those experiences? Are there certain ways to phrase things that stand out? I think it changes for every everything you're saying. So in the same way that you might describe a movie one way and talk about a sports game another way, um, for each notification, you know, we try to figure out what is the message we're trying to give someone um, and then how do we make it as easy as possible for them to use that information in the notification. I mean, the nice thing about Go is that all the notifications are actionable. And what I mean by that is we only give you information you can act on. So we always focus on telling you what something is and then showing you how you can act on it. Um, and by doing that, I think that's why we get a really strong response because we don't send someone a notification that says, hey, we've got something interesting. Do you want to take a look? We really only send you things you can use. Like in the same way that your, you know, your banking app might say, you know, you just received your automatic paycheck or it might say, you know, here's a, uh, you know, your new account is now open. Um, we only tell you things that you can use right away. Can you give us an example of that for Go in yeah. particular? Yeah. So um, if you're a student and you say, send me student notifications, um, you can turn that on. And then let's say it's the end of the semester. So maybe it's you know, the um, middle of June or end of May. You'd receive a notification that says, uh, students at San Jose State now qualify for student discounts. You know, tap here to get your discount. And you'll tap. And then you can call the agent and give them your grades um, if you want and then get those savings. Great. And then once you see people swiping the notification, are you seeing a high conversion rate? Yeah. So um, most of the people who tap on the notifications do end up using the information in them. And I think that's because they're so action oriented. And so once you have, so once I slide my notification and I come to the app, you mentioned part of it is even where it takes me in the app. What do you mean by that? So sometimes a notification will just open up uh, an app to you know the main screen and other times it will take you to exactly um, where you uh, want to go. So if you think of like a, a social app like Instagram, if, when you, if it, when it said someone liked your photo, if you tap that and just took you to the home screen, you wouldn't know what to look at. But when it takes you to that specific photo and shows you who liked it, it's a lot more useful. So for Go, for example, if we say get a student discount, we'll take you to the screen in the app that has your insurer, and then with one tap, you can be on the phone with them. So all that information is already there, so you don't have to think about it. With each of those things, what stands out to me, especially when you compare it to the traditional experience, is you just keep taking things away to make mm -hmm. it as simple as possible. What's your process like when you're going to add or remove a feature? What makes something worthy to be on the platform? We try to have as few things as possible because we think something that's simpler is easier to use. Um, so anytime we do want to add something, we really think about, is this something that our customers absolutely need and will really benefit from? And then if we do think that's the case, then we'll test those things in the product and then measure um, if it worked better when that was included, if it worked then when it wasn't included. And then from there, if it works better, we'll give it to more people in the product. How long are you typically testing for? It depends on what we're looking at. Um, usually for a minimum of a week because we want enough time to really understand, you know, maybe Monday mornings people act different than they do Friday afternoon. Um, so we want enough time to understand what's going on. And then sometimes we'll have ongoing tests where we're looking at things that are more long term and let's say compare something over several months. Okay. And so once you complete that test and your team comes back together, what's the debrief process like? So we're, we're very metrics and growth driven. Um, so all throughout Go on all the different walls, there's different dashboards. Um, everything's completely open so anyone can see at any time. You know, this is the number of people who have called an insurer today. This is the number of people who got to this screen. Um, so we'll look at the analytics and then we'll compa compare. We'll say option A, you know, did this well. Option B, did that well. And then we'll, we'll talk about that and discuss what we think the, what that means and then from there decide what we're going to do next, which could be going with the new option, staying with the last one. A lot of times it's coming up with a new set of tests we want to run from the, what we've learned. Um, and then it's, uh, it's really just trying to focus on keeping a small enough number of tests where we can understand what's going on.
How many tests are you guys typically running? Uh, I don't know the exact number, but when I, when I said small, I mean a lot of stuff is running automated. Um, okay. So we're probably looking at you know, thousands of variations of things. So it's a pretty high number, but when you have you know, computer programs involved, it can simplify how you look at all that information. So you mentioned that, and this always sticks out to me, because we always say that you want to be data-driven. But when it's your idea and the data is not supporting you, you don't want to be data driven. You want to keep trying it. When do you know, hey, I'm going to persevere with this because I think I'm on to something. And then when do you say, you know what, I really have to let this go? I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I think our team are very open and very collaborative. Um, so it really does come back to the data to say, okay, is this doing better than that? Um, I think the time you're talking about where sometimes there's something that you don't really have any data for or the data doesn't look like it's working but you feel like you know it really must work um, I think those are the more intuitive things so I think at that point it's just a discussion with the team to say you know do we all really believe in this and the data doesn't look good at all but let's take another shot at it in a different way and see if something changes um, and I think it's just a balance between the things that you can measure and you know incrementally continue to improve um, over and over again versus the things that you just take kind of a leap of faith at and, and hope they work and then measure them. Um, so I think you have to balance that because if you're always doing all these big guesses, then you know, you're not getting the advantage of being able to measure things. And if you're always trying to grow something by a very tiny amount, then you're not going to have that kind of breakthrough in the product. So we have, you know, we've had those breakthrough ideas that will triple the response someone uses on something. Um, and then we've had those ideas that will make something go up by, you know, 1%, but we'll do it 52 weeks in a row and that, you know, adds up over time. Got it. And as far as tests that you guys have been conducting since you launched, what have you learned about the way people use your product? I think probably three things. Um, one, we've learned everyone really likes things that are simple and don't take as much time, which sounds kind of obvious, but I think um, when a lot of products are built, they're built with the idea of what the product wants as opposed to what the customer wants. Um, so by keeping it simple, that's, I think, one of the reasons, you know, we've seen that, you know, Go has become the, the, the number one um, app in the app store for car insurance. Um, it's the reason we see the kind of customer reviews we have. I think the, the second thing we've learned is by using what's in your mobile phone, we can make it simpler and make it faster. So like we were talking about earlier, filling out your zip code with one tap, everybody prefers to push one button than to push, you know, seven. Um, and I think the third thing we've learned is, is really just to kind of keep iterating because you may not find something out after working on it for a month and then, you know, the next day of the next month, all of a sudden there's like a new piece of information which changes how you look at something. What are some things that changed in the product that you didn't expect that when you started out you're like, no, we're going to keep this for a while? Probably one of the biggest ones was sharing. So uh, we thought that almost no one would share um, just because, you know, it's not a really exciting, it's not your snap story or it's not a really cool photo on Instagram. Um, you don't think of like, if you ask someone, what's the stuff you like to share? Someone would say insurance quotes. Um, but it, we were actually, yeah, we were, we were actually the first in the industry to ever make quotes shareable. So that never happened before. Um, and we did that and it turns out one in five people will share a quote, usually message that to someone they're close to. Oh, I didn't even think of messaging for that. I think that's so important because when you find something useful, you immediately want to tell your friends and family. Yeah, exactly. And for something like insurance where you're making a big decision about money and you feel like you're about, or if you save a lot of money, you know, you're excited to say, hey, to your good friend, you know, here's a way you could do this. Um, so it turns out a lot of people do like the message quotes. And where does that, I'm thrilled you mentioned sharing because it's, it's you know, it's another subtle nuance within the app. When do you bring up the possibility to share for a user? We actually only bring it up at the very end, right when you're at the point where you're deciding if you want to uh, talk to an insurer or an insurance agent. Um, and that's another really interesting thing, that it's only in that one place and still one out of five people are doing it. So if you think about other products, sharing is kind of everywhere. So we, we think there's actually a lot more people who'd like to share, and that's one of the things we're working on now is making it easier to share and go. What have you learned about sharing, you know, whether it was here or in your past roles? I... Uh, so at Go, I think we've learned that um, people want to share things that are, that are meaningful, especially if they're going to, to message them. So being able to say, 
you know, I was paying $200 a month. I can now pay 150 and save $600 a year. That's something that's, that's really exciting to tell someone you're, you know, you're close to, whether that's like your partner or whether it's like a sibling or, um, or whoever it may be. Um, posting something like, I love this new app, you know, please click it and try to your Facebook newsfeed. I don't think a lot of people really want to do that. Um, so we, for example, that's not something we do in Go. Um, so we really try to focus on, you know, what are the things we actually think are shareable and then making it very easy for, for people to share those. I mean, I think one of the things you saw at Facebook was just the fact that it was so easy to like things that a lot of people end up liking a lot of things and then it's easy to see those things and more people like those things. So I think by, by making it very easy to take something and put it in front of more people, I think uh, that helps a product grow. I'm glad you mentioned growth because as you and I were discussing before, you guys are, of course, always focused on customer acquisition. What have you found works? Uh, the first thing is just making a product that's, that's easy to use. Um, I mean, we've been fortunately been featured by Apple in the App Store. We're, we're currently on the homepage alongside apps like Facebook and Pinterest and Instagram. Um, and by making it easy to use, people have a good experience and then they rate the product well. And then when people come to the App Store, they see that the product's rated well and then they end up using it. Um, so I think that's one of the things that's, that's worked really well. Um, Another thing is just being very focused on the data to find out what works and what does not work for customers. Um, so as much as it's about finding the next thing you want to do, it's also about removing the things that are causing friction. Um, and then the third thing I think is just being really open-minded. So, you know, we believe there are tens of millions of people who want to save money on their mobile phone on car insurance right now, and we're learning every day how to communicate with more of them and how to make that easy for them and. Um, you know, there's a lot we still have left to learn. So it's just being like really open-minded. What communication channels have you found to be most beneficial for Go in terms of acquiring customers? Um, one is uh, the App Store. So, you know, we absolutely, we're, we're really grateful for the amount of um, support we've received from um, featuring, which as you know, you, you never know if you're going to get featured. So we've just been really almost lucky in that way. Um, Another one uh, is people telling their friends, so messaging to say, hey, take, take a look at this. Um, we've been fortunate, too, that we've um, had um, different coverage. So, for example, when Apple Watch came out, NBC put us on television alongside Uber, which was you know, pretty exciting. Um, and then it's really just, I think, people telling their friends, which, of course, you know, when someone says, hey, check this out to someone else, we can't always measure that, but you can start to kind of see how that grows over time. And during the early days, especially when Go was a new name, how did you explain this to people? Because a lot of times, even if a solution is better and is going to save us money, we're just so used to the way that we've always done it that we're not always sure we're going to adopt. I think uh, one of the biggest things is that we, we let people know it's a car insurance app that you can compare quotes in under 60 seconds instead of 30 minutes. So most people have compared quotes and they've done it on their desktop and it takes 30 minutes. And when they find out it could take 60 seconds in Go, um, I think that's, that's pretty compelling. It was really just how fast it was. Because if you can take a minute to see if you could save you know, hundreds of dollars or even up to $500, most people say that's worth you know, a minute of their time. A minute of their time at home in their PJs. It's hard to beat. Yeah, it's on your phone. So you can just open the app and, and do it pretty easily. What surprised you? so far, Kevin, about your journey at Go, you know, whether it was the product, the reception, your team? Um, I think, so I, I'm pretty, uh, I try to be pretty open-minded, so I'm not surprised by, by a lot of things. Um, but I think one of the things was just seeing how much making the product simple changed the, the growth. So as, a, as an example, um, the average percentage of people who make a phone call when they're going through uh, comparing car insurance quotes is 4%. Um, we thought if you're looking for insurance, it makes sense that more than four in 100 people would want to actually try to see if they could save by talking to an agent. So with Go, it's now close to 30 out of every 100 people. Um, so it's, it's almost eight times more than what has happened in the past 10 years. Um, so... I think initially uh, a lot of people would have guessed it'd be hard to make something be, go, eight, go eight times, you know, 
better than it what did before. Um, but we think that can be even higher. So I think, you know, it's just being really open-minded about how much things can change. And I think that's a mindset that you really develop over time because yeah. you've had so many experiences. You've been a founder before, as you said, you've spent time at Facebook. What past experiences have really helped you shape, you know, both the trajectory and the culture at Go? Um, I think in terms of the culture, it starts with the team. So probably the most important thing I can do outside of making sure our customers like what we're delivering is, is building the team. Um, so I've, I focused a lot on making sure that our, our team is completely flat, um, making sure that it's very collaborative. So, I mean, some of the, even the tools we use internally, things like Slack to make it very easy to, for everyone to talk or the kind of analytics we use to make it easy for everyone to see. Um, so I, I think the culture has really been shaped by having a, a team that's very collaborative, um, very flat, everyone's very open. Um, we like to go, go, go fast and get a lot done. Um, and then in terms of the trajectory, I think it's really focusing on something that people value and then being humble enough to realize the parts that aren't working and trying to just continue to keep making it better, which is, which is what we try to do. And when you say flat organization, I think sometimes we hear that someone has an autonomous culture or there's no titles and it kind of sounds like everyone comes into work and does what they feel like doing that day. What is the reality of that culture? Uh, yeah, that's definitely not what our flat culture is. Um, so the, the way I think about it is uh, the difference between collaboration and consensus, and this sounds a little bit detailed, um, but consensus is when you've got four people sitting at a table and you go around the table and say, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, and, and so on. Um, collaboration is when you have four people at the table and say, does anyone have any thoughts on this? So people are free to participate when they want to, but they're not obligated to when they don't want to. And I think what that does, that lets people get really involved in the things they're excited about, but then also have faith and belief that others on their team who are more excited will contribute if they're not the one who wants to. Um, and we also have a lot of uh, ownership. So each team member on Go owns a very significant um, part of the product. So even um, actually our, our offer letters say that um, when you join the, the team at Go, you'll probably do the work of five to ten people at a very large company. And we're, we're, we're pretty well balanced, so you know, we're not here working every weekend. Um, you know, people take time off for vacation. Most of the team was gone for, for most of the holiday. Um, but we, we really try to get a lot done very fast and, and have everyone really own what they're doing. And because of that, I think you, know, you feel really excited when you see something change in the product or you see you know, someone, a positive review about something, and then you can say, you know, I built that. Not that you were one of 50 people who built a piece of it, but knowing that you actually built that part. And how does that work for project organization? Do you have a project lead or is it a group that's working on something? So the whole team um, can see what everyone else is doing. So we have a, an open doc that everyone can see. Here's what someone's working on and the status of it. Um, and then basically as things are complete, um, people will mark they're done and then they'll come up with the next thing to do or they'll, they'll talk with other team members if it's not clear what to do um, and then continue to update it there. So everything's very, very collaborative and it's, um, we just use different uh, basically like shared workspace tools to, to be able to see what everyone's doing. And, and Slack is a big part of it too, just being able to communicate really fast. Great. And how about for you, Kevin? You know, what does it feel like to be at this stage in your career versus when you founded SkyGrid? Yeah, I think now um, there's definitely a lot of things I've learned where I kind of uh, know the pieces that need to be put in place to get to where we're going. Um, so early on, I think you don't know as kind of what some things might look like. So you're a lot more of saying, should we go this way or that way or that way? And you have to quickly figure out which way to go. I think now we know that, you know, this is the direction we need to go. And it's more of a question of, can we get that done and actually execute and get there? So I think that's kind of one of the differences now is, is knowing where we need to go and how to get there. And the question is just if we will get there, as opposed to earlier on, you don't know exactly where you need to go or how you're going to get there. So I think things are a lot clearer now than they've been. And I, I try to learn new things all the time. So, you know, I hope that's kind of a result of trying to do that. 
What are some of the core things, whether you know it's been the past couple of years at Go or just as you reflect on your career that you've learned that have been really helpful for you? I think one of the biggest ones, and I really learned this a lot at Facebook, was just how much uh, time to to invest with your your team. Um, so it's it's really making sure that everyone has nothing in their way. So we call that being unblocked. Um, so no one has anything blocking them from what they need to do. Um, really making sure that things are very open so everyone can see everything else and, and move very quickly. Um, and then also trying to make things as collaborative as possible. So whether that's from you know the way the office is laid out or the kind of tools we use or making sure that you know everybody can see exactly how the business is doing at any moment because it's right on the screen in front of everyone. Um, so I think those things all, all make a big difference. And as far as your time at Facebook, are there any memories or, as you were saying, lessons from there that really stand out? Yeah, I think... Um, I think one is just moving very quickly and, and trying things and figuring out what works and doesn't work and then iterating on that. Um, I think two is having the data in place to understand what's going on. So I think it's, you can test things, but really having the, the data to know what is working and not working is, a, is like kind of a whole additional project in itself. Um, and then the third one is just having a, a culture where it's it's open enough where really anyone can contribute anything because I think then people feel very creative and it, it feels a lot easier to contribute. I love it and I think that as you were saying all of that really does occur and kind of download to you as you navigate your career. One of the past insights you've shared is that you always try to surround yourself with people who have done or are doing what you want to do. Who have some of your mentors been? Um, I've been really fortunate to work with a lot of uh, great people. So th those obviously include, you know, the team members I've worked alongside. Um, I've uh, also with uh, with SkyGrid, we had an incredible set of investors. Obviously, there were a lot of a um, lot of really helpful people at Facebook, um, and then as well as um, Go, there've been a lot of um, a lot of great people involved. So I couldn't really, I don't kind of have a list off the top of my head, but I I just I really think that you know every person you meet has something they're exceptional at and maybe multiple things and it's trying to kind of find what that one exceptional thing is that you can learn from and I think if you do that you know that that adds up over time. What's something really cool you've learned recently? Um doesn't have to be professional, it can be anything. Probably and this is this is related to insurance. It was is yesterday. Um I was reading a history of the Great Depression and how it changed insurance. And so when uh, there are less cars sold, there is less people buying insurance because there's less cars. But what's interesting is when um, there's less cars sold, the number of claims or accidents that people file actually goes up. And so because people have less money, um, it ends up that people think to file their claims, they're kind of more they're more on top of it than they would be otherwise. So I thought that was really interesting that when you look at if the you know, stock market is doing well or not doing as well, it actually change how often people will file a claim. So the same kind of accident will be interpreted two different ways based on how the stock market's doing. That's very cool. And I have to say, when you started out with the Great Depression and car insurance, I was like, I don't know where this one's going to go. <laughs> Before we finish up, Kevin, we always focus the last couple of minutes of our interviews just on three questions that don't have to do with work. Since you're in car insurance, I figured we'd start with this one. If you could have any car delivered to the outside of your office right now, free of charge, what car would it be? I like the car I have now, so I don't have like a supercar in mind or, um, you know, I, I mean, I think... I think some of the new cars that Tesla's coming out with are, you know, really fascinating just because of what they're doing around innovation and batteries and energy. I think that's that's super cool. I don't have a Tesla myself, but I think it's it's pretty exciting what they're doing. Awesome. We'll have, we'll we'll try this one instead of the car. If you could have any vacation starting tomorrow, all inclusive, where would you go? I'd probably go to a beach and somewhere with. Uh, with snorkeling and, and scuba diving and, and the water, I think just being by, by the ocean is really peaceful, and I, I like that. I think it's a you know fun place to hang out with friends. Sounds like a plan. We'll do my best to make that happen. 
All right, last one. If you could go back in time to any period of time in your life or before, where would you want to go back to? Probably around the time Da Vinci was alive. I think he created and imagined and built so many things in so many different areas that I think it'd just be fascinating to be able to, to sit with him and talk with him and watch as those things are happening. Sorry, I have less of a chance of making that happen. We could try to, we could try to shoot for the car of the trip, but I think that's a great way to end it. I've never gotten that answer before. Kevin, how can everyone stay up to date with your team's work and with you personally? Uh, probably first by getting our app, which is the, it's the number one result in the app store for car insurance. So if you go to the app store and search for car insurance, you'll see it. You can obviously search for Go as well. Um, and then uh, we're also on Instagram with Save with Go. So that's kind of where the latest information is there and everything that, that's going on with Go. Fantastic. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. Yeah, thank, thanks, for, for, thanks for inviting me and having me.